3rd of October, 1993, afternoon. A group of Black Hawk helicopters fly a team of army rangers into a busy market area in downtown Mogadishu. Their mission, to capture two lieutenants of the Somali warlord, Mohammed ID. But the mission suddenly goes wrong, very wrong. We've got five aircraft down, and these are flown by our best pilots. We are struggling as a crew to get that aircraft on its wheels. How did I do that? I have no idea. I caught a glimpse of them just as they were crashing. A uh, huge dust ball. Uh, it looked from a distance that you know, nobody could survive that type of accident. 18 American soldiers are killed. 76 are wounded. Hundreds of Somalis are dead. The events of that day have since become legend. You find out that some of your best friends, uh, in fact, didn't make it out. And it, it, was, it was pretty devastating. Using rare archive film and reenactments, Battle Stations flies with one of the most sophisticated helicopters in the U.S. Army, the Black Hawk. Vietnam, the combat helicopter comes of age. It was here that the world-famous American Huey changed the form of modern warfare. Thousands of Hueys provided a platform from which massive firepower could be unleashed. Vietnam was the first air mobile war. At that time, the Huey uh, was a remarkable helicopter, and the Army seized upon it in Vietnam to provide that air mobility role. But the Huey was designed basically as an aeromedical evacuation machine, and it just didn't have all the capabilities that the Army found was necessary in Vietnam. By 1972, plans for future conflicts turned away from the jungles of Southeast Asia and looked towards Cold War strategies for the plains of Europe. So in January, the US Army issued a tender for a new multi-role frontline helicopter. With a crew of four, the next generation of helicopters had to be capable of lifting 11 men, or equivalent weight of cargo, up to 4,000 feet with a cruising speed of 200 miles per hour. A long time ago, a great man had the idea for something like a helicopter. His name was Leonardo da Vinci. Igor Sikorsky had devoted his genius since the First World War to the development of the helicopter. In 1939, he had designed the world's first working helicopter and had since produced over 5,000 for military use. But in the 1960s, Sikorsky was devastated when his company lost the vital Huey contract to the Bell Company. Business was getting less and less. After the Korean War conflict subsided, uh, our deliveries began to shrink dramatically to the point when, in 1977, we did not deliver a single helicopter to the U.S. government. We could not miss out on Army business because the Army represented the, the greatest, biggest users for helicopters. In August 1972, the Boeing, Vertol, and Sikorsky companies were selected to produce prototypes for the new Army helicopter. It was a matter of life and death for Sikorsky from a business point of view. We simply had to be one of the winners. So what uh, the company did is set up two design teams. Uh, I was fortunate to head one, and uh, uh, another wonderful designer headed the other. And then the same day, we presented top management with what our concepts would be for the Black Hawk helicopter. The first prototype was flown in October 1974 six weeks ahead of schedule. The Army had specified crash worthiness as a key requirement, and with this, the helicopter was able to carry heavier loads than anticipated. By June 1976, testing was complete, with flights logged hot and high, from desert to Arctic conditions. But late at night on August the 9th, 1976, disaster struck. Ray Leone received a call about a crash at Fort Campbell. It was a call he would never forget. I remember being uh, awoken about one o'clock in the morning 
saying that one of our prototypes had crashed. And of course, to me, it was like receiving a call from a local hospital about your son or daughter involved in an automobile crash. They wouldn't tell you any details, just you better get here quickly. And we got there for August 10th in the morning. And we got out to the woods where the aircraft was, and you couldn't really even see the helicopter until you were practically upon it. That's how dense the woods were. And uh, we learned what had happened was that there was a full crew, 14 Army young people, in our prototype flying at night. The skin of the rotor blade had come loose and caused violent vibration. The pilot had no choice but to crash land immediately. But he did a remarkable piloting job. He came straight down, chopping trees all the way down. He cut down about 40 trees with the rotor blades, big trees, and landed kind of hard, but he landed OK. Turned out the only injury was when one of the occupants, the, the uh, squad leader, jumped out of the helicopter. He ran smack in with the stump of a tree that the rotor had cut down, and he got a little bruise. Well, the very next day, uh, on August 11th, the Army team came in and put on four new main rotor blades, put on a new tail rotor, cranked up the engines, and my God, it took off like the Phoenix. And you couldn't imagine the, the relief that we had knowing there were minimal injuries to the Army crew and the aircraft was still flyable. The near disaster was a stroke of luck for the Sikorsky design team. Sikorsky was now able to offer conclusive proof of the new helicopter's ability to survive a crash. Finally, in December 1976, Sikorsky was declared the winner and awarded the much-needed helicopter contract. The American military now had the world's most advanced twin turbine battlefield helicopter. The unique flexible design, packed with electronic warfare systems, was intended for air assault work, air cavalry, and medevac missions. It will go down in history as the Black Hawk and become renowned for its role in special operations as the Night Stalker. 1978. The Black Hawk frontline helicopter flies in service for the first time. But this cutting edge technology is still untested in the field of battle. The high speed Black Hawk has an exhilarating low level flying capability. The first time you get into a, an aircraft like that, uh, it's a feeling of, I've just grabbed hold of a rocket ship. I mean, really, it, because it's such a difference in the, in the complex uh, cockpit and the, and the capabilities of the aircraft. It's far beyond anything you've experienced before. It's fun to fly. It'll do anything. It'll give you every bit of the performance that it's supposed to and just a little bit more. It's big, it's roomy, it's versatile. It's got a great sound. The power from the rotor system, the, the massiveness of the uh, airframe, and just power and strength. It was much more powerful than usual. The sophisticated Black Hawk was packed with the latest avionics weapons systems. In addition, the helicopter was fitted with two machine guns operated by the crew chiefs. Its outstanding versatility required new skills of flying and crew coordination. There are two sets of controls, and for all intents and purposes, they're exact duplicates of each other. There is no pilot in command station. You could be pilot in command from either the left seat or the right seat, it really doesn't matter. When it comes to aircraft control, it is whoever is on the controls. Crew coordination is probably one of the most important aspects that uh, we in the regiment and as pilots need to develop and to maintain. You have to have a lot of trust and confidence and respect for each position. Uh, no one position on the aircraft is more important than the other. When I say left or come right or come up 50 feet or come down five feet, uh, they really have to do that. There will never be a landing where the crew chief's not out the window looking down saying 20 feet, 15 feet, 10 feet, two feet, tails on the ground, you, know, you clear down. That's what you would hear during a typical approach. By 1981, the Army had found a perfect match for the advanced capabilities of the Black Hawk, the Special Forces. 
the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment became the night stalkers, capable of striking undetected by undertaking covert missions anywhere in the world. Specialist crews were trained in night vision navigation and advanced flying techniques using night vision goggles and forward-looking infrared. We're basically the pioneer behind the night vision systems uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, very, very stressful. Uh, it, it's tenfold trying to navigate, uh, land, uh, shoot, all those things compounded at night. You've got shades of green, and those shades of green are telling you uh, different things about the terrain, the ground, uh, the water, uh, your speed, uh, your height, um, closure rates, angles, and you have to uh, fly quite a few hours to be able to read your screens or your MVGs, night vision goggles, and get actual feel for how they work and what you are looking at and how that actually relates to what it is in the ground in the daytime. You're using a combination of what you can see through the night vision goggles and then underneath the night vision goggles to whatever's around you in the cockpit because you need both pieces of the puzzle, if you will, to enable to control the aircraft. One of the most dangerous things that a crew chief could do, uh, especially in special operations, is the night flying, confined space, trying to get into a space that can barely fit a helicopter. It's difficult, but once you've developed those skills, it's the only way to fly at night. You have to have them. Uh, Blackhawks and night vision goggles hit the Army pretty much at the same time. And there's no way that we could do the missions that we do now and since then without night vision goggles. In 1983, the Black Hawks faced their baptism of fire. In October, the U.S. invaded the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada, believing that Soviet and Cuban advisors were intent on building a military base. Operation Urgent Fury had begun. America had vivid memories of being on the brink of nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis some 20 years earlier. I had just gotten to the unit. I was only there for about a month. And I was brand new to the Black Hawk. I only had about 15 hours total in the aircraft. It was all very new to me. I hardly didn't even know anyone in the unit. So I was very, very uncomfortable going into this. And we took off at night. I, I can't remember how many aircraft we had. I want to say about eight. And uh, headed for Grenada, which was about an hour and 20 minutes away, in an aircraft that has two hours and 20 minutes of fuel. And uh, flew over the water at night, no horizon, hazy. Uh, we had been up for two days straight, getting there, um, very nerve wracking. And uh, we, got, uh, we got to Grenada just about maybe a half hour after, uh, probably right around sunrise. And then uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, we flew our first mission. Due to delays delivering their night vision equipment, Black Hawk crews had to operate in broad daylight flying troops into battle and evacuating civilian hostages from the revolutionary forces. I had one of the few aircraft that had a Vietnam veteran pilot on board and I was very happy to be with him. And I remember at one point I, I took my fingers and I put them under my legs because I didn't want to look down and see if they were shaking. And I thought, well, that's probably not a good thing to do because we need to take the controls if he gets hit. We did that assault and then three more assaults bringing uh, people in. By the end of the operation, the American forces had captured more than 600 Cubans. The overall failure of poor intelligence had made the operation costly in terms of personnel and equipment. Over the three-day campaign, the Black Hawks had not been used to their full potential. Flying by day rather than taking advantage of their specialized night flying techniques had made special operations chaotic. Urgent Fury had lived up to its name. A lot of the main lessons that we learned in Grenada was, yes, we absolutely uh, have to be able to operate these aircraft at night uh, much more effectively. We have to modify these aircraft, the cockpit lighting, and we have to really embrace uh, the whole idea of night vision goggles. 
The clandestine eyes of the Night Stalkers were soon to be tested halfway around the world on the battlefields of Arabia. Desert Storm. On August the 2nd, 1990, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein occupies neighboring oil-rich Kuwait. To his surprise, the West reacts swiftly, and President Bush forms a coalition determined to oust the Iraqi forces. Half a million American and coalition forces assembled in the desert under the command of General Norman Schwarzkopf. On January the 17th, 1991, Operation Desert Storm, the mission to liberate Kuwait, began with a huge aerial bombardment against Iraqi military targets. Navy Seahawks and Black Hawks were on the scene to rescue any pilots shot down during the bombing campaign. Most people think about the desert as being a place that's very hot. And it, it was in the summer, but in the winter at night, it got very cold. In fact, there was one particular mission where we flew through a sandstorm, then flew through a snowstorm, and then when we returned to the airfield where our Ford support base was, it was fogged in to the point where it was about a quarter mile visibility. The Black Hawk liked the desert. The desert is, is a hard environment to learn. First off, it's unforgiving. Our mission profiles kept us relatively close to the ground, uh, and you will plow into a sand dune that you swear you were 50 foot or 100 foot above, but somehow it jumped out and it bit you. The time it took to, to learn how to fly over the desert varied from a few hours to sometimes months. When the Iraqis began to fire missiles against coalition military sites and Israel, Several Black Hawks were sent on hunt and destroy missions to track down the missiles and their mobile launchers. One remarkable mission took place in late February 1991, when Jim Chrysafuli's regiment of night stalkers had infiltrated a team of special forces deep into Iraq. But things went awry, and one of the teams that uh, our regiment had put in had gotten compromised. A young Iraqi girl had discovered one of the teams, and they had come under fire. Now they needed to be extracted. Every second counted. We're talking about three men surrounded by 200 miles either way of an unfriendly country and bad guys. We ran to the aircraft, and we had them spun up. And as we moved the airplane over, uh, to make room for our formation launch, we looked over and the second aircraft was on fire. That's not good. We were, we were obviously concerned. We knew that they were gonna scrap the mission because a daylight mission, single ship, uh, 200 miles into Iraq, was zero survivability, or certainly very, very low. Randy and I were clamoring. We said, we'll just go without them. We'll just go without the authorization. We waited. They said, go, and we went and that airplane took off like out of bat of hell. When we crossed the border, we didn't hear uh, a round fire. You don't hear it with 145 decibels anyway. So we dropped it down to 20 feet and then 15 feet, and then we moved it down to 10 feet. The F-16 providing air support relayed an urgent message. The special forces were under heavy fire and running out of ammunition. If Chris Fully wasn't there in 10 minutes, There'd be no point showing up. That's bad. You look at the map, and there's got to be a shorter way. And like everything else, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that's what we did. We crossed over uh, at least a brigade-sized Iraqi unit. And all we saw was flashes and pieces of equipment and heads turning up. We crossed them at 15 and 20 feet. People, by the time they turned around to see what was going on, we were gone crossed over one dune, and you could, you could smell the dust and the heat in the air, and the engines were running hot, and everybody was, was focused and calling out you know, perceived bad guys, turn left, turn right, and at about 10 feet, I saw a small dune. We cruised directly over the dune, and literally out of the blue, uh, there was a donkey directly in front of me, and he seemed huge. <laughs> 
and I bumped the collective back up and I went straight over his head. Now a donkey, even the tallest donkey, is probably only five, maybe six feet, and we dang near slammed directly into him. So we were pretty low. As we were heading into the target area, we were within five kilometers. We knew that there was a large set of uh, power lines. So I, I turned to Randy and I said, we're going to go under. We're going to go under. And he, he repeated. He said, we're going under. And everybody goes, OK, we're going under. And as we got closer and closer, we wound up seeing a smaller set of power lines that was directly under the major set of power lines. I said, Randy, I can't go under. I can't go under. We're going over. Miraculously, Chris fully escaped hitting the power lines. Suddenly, the crew chief spotted the team below. I finally see him. And here's the bravest man in the world. Jeff Sims is standing on the berm on the edge of a ditch, and he's wa waving a VS-17 panel in the middle of a firefight, surrounded by bad guys. And there were bodies all around him, people that he engaged and eliminated. You don't get that courage by accident. Radios wanted to know what was going on. The minis kept producing noise, flying about 4,000 a minute times two. I saw that probably the best way for us to position the airplane was to slam it back down around about southwest. And that would place us in between most of the Iraqi ground fire and Jeff. Chris Afuli thought he was there to pick up six operators, but there were only three. I'm thinking, oh god, we left three on the ground. Says, Where are they? Where are they? He says, they're not here. We're there's only three. Let's go. And everybody seemed to scream in unison, let's go. And the airplane is still taking hits. Flight controls took hits. Rotor blades were taking hits. We took off. Under cover of the dust cloud, the special forces made good their escape. For their heroic actions, Jim Crisofulli and co-pilot Randy Stevens were decorated with the Distinguished Flying Cross. Jeff Sims, leader of the special forces team, was awarded the Silver Star. For several weeks, the Allies kept up the aerial bombardment on Iraq. Saddam's war machine was battered, but not broken. Schwarzkopf now prepared for a major ground assault to finish the job off. At 4 a.m. on February the 24th, 1991, the ground war was launched. It was led by the largest helicopter assault in history. 300 helicopters spearheaded by Black Hawks lifted 5,000 airborne troops 110 miles deep into Iraqi territory. The operation was a stunning success. Thousands of Iraqi soldiers were taken prisoner. Within 100 hours, the ground war in Iraq was over. The Black Hawk operation with the 101st Airborne had proved the value of a rapid heliborne assault, and not a single American had lost his life. For two years, the Black Hawk helicopter and its crews enjoyed the accolades of total success from the Gulf War. But all that was about to change. The Night Stalker's next mission would become a nightmare that would haunt America to this day. Mogadishu. Mogadishu, Somalia, 1993. It began as a great humanitarian mission and became the costliest battle for US troops since Vietnam. Somalia had suffered from years of terror by rebel warlords, and now the beleaguered country was in the grip of a major famine. America had joined a UN peacekeeping force of 38,000 troops. In June 1993, local warlord Mohammed Aidid's forces killed 24 UN peacekeeping troops whilst they were patrolling the streets of Mogadishu. America responded with a series of snatch and grab raids on Aidid strongholds led by Black Hawk Night Stalkers with US Special Forces. October the 3rd, 1993, a further mission is planned to capture Aidid's top two lieutenants. The American Joint Operational Command used live TV and radio equipment from observational helicopters to control the operation and to produce publicity pictures for the world's press. So it is decided to go for a daylight assault on the target house. Operation Irene is planned to take less than one hour, 
but the mission is fatally flawed. Without a doubt, we all prefer to go at night. All the things that we had give us a tactical advantage at night. In the daytime, it becomes a fair fight. Nobody wants a fair fight. In a military operation, you want as much advantage as you can possibly put into the mix. And by going at night, that gives us that advantage. We wanted to do every single mission uh, that we could at night. If they were available during the day, we went after them during the day. But we would prefer to hit every target at night. For the Black Hawk crews, this mission on the target house is filled with danger. This one was as hazardous as any we had flown. The dust conditions were as bad as they had been anywhere else. It was in a place called the Black Sea, which is where most of the enemy was located. There were no landing zones. An alleyway in a city like Mogadishu is not big enough, and we knew that we couldn't land, which doesn't limit us in putting people on the ground because we're flexible and we can do what's called a, uh, a fast rope uh, insertion. But it limits us in how we get them out. So we knew that there was additional risk on this mission. And I think everyone sensed that as we walked out to the aircraft, but we still felt that it was an ex acceptable risk and we took it on. On the afternoon of October the 3rd, eight Black Hawks lead an air armada of 19 aircraft 12 vehicles and 160 Delta and Ranger forces into the heart of Mogadishu. The trail helicopter is known as Super 6 2. Want to stack up about 200 feet? The mission of my crew, we carried, uh, we were in Super 6 2. We carried Delta operators on board who would actually go into the building and capture the people they were going after and secure them and bring them back to the base. Once we dropped off our operators, my responsibility on my gun was to take out any type of threat. Uh, to the ground forces, to either to the Rangers or to the Delta, Delta operators uh, with the miniguns. Leading four Black Hawks and carrying a Ranger blocking force to prevent Somali reinforcements from arriving is Mike Durant in Super 6-4. Mike elected to bring us to a hover, thinking it would just be a few seconds. I would tell you it probably was maybe 30 seconds, maybe a little bit longer. It felt like an hour, where we're just hovering in broad daylight over the city Yes, we're blowing up a tremendous amount of dust. We're kind of making a smoke screen for ourselves. It was a very, very, very uncomfortable, very, very vulnerable feeling. Right, I'm currently hovering in the uh, southwest corner of the uh, Amazon. We were very successful in, in implementing, uh, putting our operators uh, where they needed to be at the target so they could perform their mission. And in fact, their mission went well. They captured and uh, detained everyone that they needed to that was in that uh, building. And uh, it wasn't until after that, when they went to get out of the facility, uh, that we started running into problems. We got everybody in where they needed to go. Uh, departed the area, went north of the city, and for all intents and purposes, we were done. Because we couldn't go back in to do an extraction, we knew we were just a contingency force at that point. When the worst of all contingencies happened. About 40 minutes into the mission, uh, Cliff Walcott and Donovan Briley's aircraft was shot down by what we think was a rocket propelled grenade. The first inclination I had that there was a problem was when Super 6-1 called that they had been hit and were going down. I caught a glimpse of them just as they were crashing. A uh, huge dust ball. Uh, it looked from a distance that you know, nobody could survive that type of accident. When I heard that we have a Black Hawk down, we have a Black Hawk down, and they would start saying he's crashed, I just remembered tensing up in the aircraft thinking, well, where there's, where there's one RPG, there's going to be another one on the way. And I really thought, the jig is up now. They're, they're going to get us. And uh, I just remember thinking, God, I wish these guys would hurry up and get out the door. Super 6-1 is shot down by small arms fire from the Somalis, killing both pilots. A little bird crew makes an incredible landing at the crash site and drags out the two survivors, taking them to the U.S. hospital. By now, American Special Forces vehicles on the ground are being shot up on all sides by the local Somali forces. Paul Shannon witnessed the Black Hawk down, and now his aircraft, under the command of Mike Goffina, comes under fire. When I was hit, both hands on the minigun, uh, scanning for targets. 
and all of a sudden my hand, left hand hit my chest and I rolled off the seat into the back of the aircraft. Jeff, which side of the aircraft is he on? He is sitting right behind you. Gary Gordon uh, went to his little backpack he had and whipped out an IV and I'll never forget it. I told him I was okay, that you know I didn't need an IV, it was just a, you know, hopefully a minor wound, it wasn't bleeding real bad. And, I wanted to make sure that he had ample time to do what he needed to do, shoot, shoot out the back and not worry about me. Brad Hollings took my spot on the gun. He was one of the operators in the back, and uh, he began to shoot the minigun. He gave me his rifle to shoot uh, out the back, and that's where I took up a position. Now I had a little rifle in my hand, and I'm sitting kind of vulnerable in the back. So I had a lot of time to reflect, and. Uh, Saw a lot of things coming at us and knew it was probably inevitable that if we stayed, you know, on the flight pattern, we we're probably bound to eventually get hit. The Somalis had become experts with the RPG launchers, and now victim number two was in their sights. Mike Durant and his crew were busy providing fire support to the Rangers trapped below. We joined the orbit with uh, Super 6-2. Um, just a few minutes, maybe two or three, that he was in the area. And uh, all of a sudden, he called and he said, whoa, uh, six fours hit, six fours hit. We only made it around the pattern probably four or five times, and we were hit by what we think was a rocket-propelled grenade also, right in the tail. I can't remember exactly. There were a couple of exchanges back and forth. He said, I'm heading for the airfield. I thought in my head that this is a flyable machine. Everything looks OK inside. It's made to take this kind of punishment. If I land here, I'll have to crash it intentionally, because there are no landing zones. So I'm going to have to just crash it in an alleyway just to, for the sake of getting it on the ground. We were flying for about five seconds when uh, the tail completely disintegrated, and uh, about three feet of the vertical fin went along with it. All of a sudden, uh, then he called, and uh, six boards going down. Mike is not an easily rattled person. Uh, the tone of his voice, uh, I, I felt like I had been electrocuted. I'm hearing that. And I thought, this he's, he's in bad shape. He's either got flight controls and are not responding now, or he's in free fall. The only thing I could see was brown earth and blue sky. Everything else was a complete blur. Once I brought that nose up, because we were pitching forward, we ended up in a flat spin at 70 feet. The only thing going through my mind at that point is stay upright. Get the aircraft on the wheels. It's designed to absorb impact, but only on the wheels. If you land on its side or if you land upside down, all those safety features are totally worthless. So we are struggling as a crew to get that aircraft on its wheels. How did I do that? I have no idea. Sunday, October the 3rd, 1993. Special Forces helicopters relay shocking live pictures from the war-torn streets of Mogadishu. America's worst nightmare is unfolding. 160 Delta and Ranger forces are fighting for their lives, pinned down by hundreds of armed Somalis in the heart of the city. Black Hawk Super 6-1 had been shot down. Super 6-4 had taken a hit, and along with his co-pilot Ray Frank, pilot Mike Durant was struggling to control the aircraft. As soon as the tail came off, I made a radio call stating that we had lost the tail rotor and we were going in hard. Then I remember looking over at Ray, saying something about, we better pull the engines off. He knew exactly what to do. He was already doing it. But the truth of the matter is, the centrifugal force was so severe that he could not keep his arms up to shut those engines off. It actually drove his arms down. Uh, so we ended up with one engine at about half power and one at about idle power. He called again. He said, six four is going in hard. And uh, just before he hit it, he just screamed Ray's name. I really thought they were all dead. Six four, you OK? I don't remember actually hitting the ground, 
but uh, we hit very hard, hard enough that even with all the safety features on the Blackhawk and as rugged as it is, my femur or my thigh bone still snapped in two on the seat when we hit the ground. Amidst the wreckage, Mike Durant and Ray Franks lie unconscious. Crew chiefs Tommy Field and Bill Cleveland are also severely injured. They will not last long without help. Nobody was there to help them. They were basically on their own. Uh, fortunately, the bad guys weren't there yet. There was very few um, around that area. Mike Goffino in Super 6-2 flies over the site to drop in two Delta Force snipers. Uh, our backseaters, uh, uh, Randy Shukart and Gary Gordon, the two Medal of Honor winners, uh, requested permission to go in. We initially tried to infill uh, Randy and Gary as close as we could to Super 6-4 to Mike and, and Ray's aircraft. But due to the heavy debris that was uh, littered on the ground there, uh, it flew up in the rotor system, and we picked a little more suitable spot, but it was still cluttered with debris. And they held about a four to five foot hover. And I tapped Randy and Gary on the shoulder, and Gary gave me a thumbs up and a little smile, and he jumped out. We collectively defended the crash site for about 20 or 30 minutes before everyone else was killed and we were overrun. At Mike Durant's crash site, both Randy Sugart and Gary Gordon are killed in a ferocious firefight with Somali soldiers. The best of my knowledge, uh, what happened to, to Gary and Randy, uh, is they were just overwhelmed with uh, you know, just an abundant force uh, that just overtook them. Uh, they took out as many as they could and were down on ammo. Uh, some of the crew members had already been killed. Uh, Mike Durant was on one side of the aircraft with uh, one of the operators. The other operator was on the other side of the aircraft and uh, he was hit. Uh, they heard he was hit. Uh, they redistributed ammunition and amongst the, the people that were alive and they were just overtaken and everybody was killed except for Mike Durant. Paul Shannon, now sat in the back of Super 6-2, his hand shattered by Somali gunfire, is to have a remarkable escape. The RPG-7 came in on the right side of the aircraft, impacted right underneath the crew chief window. The RPG-7 took off Brad's knee, his right knee, basically, was, was gone. Uh, he fell back on top of me off his seat. Uh, I was knocked unconscious for you know, maybe five, ten seconds, kind of hard to tell. Uh, the co-pilot was knocked unconscious. So basically, everything relied on Mike Afina's skills as a pilot. He had tons of horns and sirens going off in his helmet. So he was instinctively trying to find a place to put us down. He thought we were going to crash right there in the city as well. So he picked out a road uh, that he was just going to set us down on. And as we started to descend, he started to pull in and collect a little bit, a little more power, and realized that we were still able to maintain flight. And what the pilot had seen was the Newport facility. There weren't any boats there. So the unloading area was clear. And we came in and did basically an aircraft landing. They had triple uh, height sealant containers, and we were sliding right for a wall of those. And fortunately, we stopped uh, in the nick of time before he ran into those. Meanwhile, the remaining Black Hawks can only watch as Mike Durant, the sole member of the crew to survive the crash, fights for his life. At this point, we've got five aircraft down and these are flown by our best pilots. Shortly after this, uh, one of the commanders on the ground called and said, I've got two wounded guys that are going to die if I don't get them out of here. Roger, I contacted higher reference to uh, they do not have any... Colonel Harrell, who was in the command and control aircraft, called and said, I can't send in any more helicopters. The area is still too hot. Just hang on. We're going to get some tanks to punch through to you with them in armored vehicles. Emotionally, for me, I don't want to overstate it too much, but here I am now prepared to do this, and now we've been let off the hook. And on the one hand, I was relieved that we were now not probably going to get shot down and killed. On the other hand, we desperately wanted to get in and help. Eventually, blooded and shocked by the chaotic nightmare, the Rangers and Delta forces are rescued by a UN armored convoy. 
The captured and tortured Michael Durant was later paraded to the world on TV. When you're initially captured, you're fearing for your life. The highest priority is survival, or are you going to make it through the next few minutes? CW3, Mike Durant, U.S. Army. You crave for information about what went on around you, where is everyone else, what's their status, did they survive? I didn't know that no one else at our crash site had survived until it was released. Whether we survived or not, they were going to get us all out of there, and I knew that. And that, that provides you some sense of security. You, you feel like maybe you're almost not alone, knowing that, that everybody's out there and they'll do what they can. Uh, I'm a Blackhawk pilot. Blackhawk pilot. I can't explain why I wasn't killed. Uh, it, it, it is a miracle. Uh, it's a miracle. It's luck. It's whatever everybody that assesses the situation happens to believe, I guess. But uh, I did some things that may have helped uh, facilitate my survival, but a lot of it was certainly out of my hands. All we knew at that point when we came back from the mission that day about Mike and Ray was that they were down and they were missing in action. We didn't find out until the rest of the world found out. And the videotape of, the, of Mike uh, when he was in captivity and the videotapes of them dragging the bodies through the streets. We were horrified, we were enraged uh, that that is what had happened to them. Uh, we, we wanted revenge, uh, probably more than anything else. Uh, those were our friends. These weren't people that we just knew casually. Uh, these were guys that we'd known for years. Uh, people talk about being a band of brothers, and you know, you're closer to these people than brothers. And uh, it was, maddening. 18 American soldiers had been killed and 76 wounded. Hundreds of Somalis had died. After five days of intense negotiations, Mike Durant was released. There's the joy in being released, and then you find out that some of your best friends, uh, in fact, didn't make it out. And it, it, was, it was pretty devastating. It took a long time to get over that. Bitter lessons had to be learned. The Night Stalkers had been used in daytime missions, not by night intended. But Mogadishu is also remembered for the incredible bravery of the task force soldiers and the exceptional flying skills of the Black Hawk air crews. The Black Hawk has been in service around the world for 25 years. With its advanced technology, this outstanding helicopter will remain in the forefront of battle in the era of electronic warfare. But for the men who crew it, the Black Hawk is something more. It is a machine of strength, ensuring success in the face of adversity. I truly believe I owe my life to the design of the Black Hawk. We hit the ground very hard. There's no question that in many other types of helicopters, it would not have been a survival crash. If not for the design of that aircraft, I wouldn't be sitting here today.
Well, I, I know exactly when. I was uh, about 13 years old, I believe, and a friend of my father's was a warrant officer in the Army. Actually, he was in the National Guard at the time, but he had been in the Army. And he worked for a company that uh, flew helicopters for hire. They would do whatever, if anybody needed a helicopter for whatever purpose, they would provide the helicopter and the crew and go out there and do work. And then he had to move an aircraft one day, and he invited me and my father to go along with him. And we flew, I'm from New Hampshire, and we flew over some of the mountainous parts of New Hampshire on a, on a beautiful day. And I remember it was a three-seater, and I was sitting in the front seat and uh, right next to Joe, who was flying. And I, I just remember thinking, this has got to be the greatest job in the world. And, uh, and it, it turned out to be. Uh, I, I never lost sight of, of that goal for the rest of my life. I, I realized that somehow I wanted to be able to fly. And if maybe if I had flown a jet for the first flight, I would have thought that was the way to make a living. But it happened to be a helicopter, and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed that flight and uh, enjoyed having a career doing that. I found out in August of 1992 that we were going to deploy to Somalia. Uh, very little time to prepare. I was at work. We got pulled in to a briefing where we were told we were going to go, and we were going to go in a matter of hours. So I ran home to grab a few things that I needed and, uh, and then headed back out to the airfield, and we, we went forward. Okay. There were high-risk elements on this particular mission. It was daytime. We didn't like that. It was in a place called the Black Sea, which is where most of the enemy was located. We didn't like that either. There were no landing zones, although a Black Hawk can fit into a lot of places. Uh, an alleyway in a city like Mogadishu is not big enough, and we knew that we couldn't land, which doesn't limit us in putting people on the ground because we're flexible and we can do what's called a, uh, a fast rope uh, insertion, but it limits us in how we get them out. You're limited then to either ground vehicles or rooftop extractions. So we knew that there was additional risk on this mission. And I think everyone sensed that as we walked out to the aircraft, but we still felt that it was an acceptable risk, and we took it on. None of these flights were very long. Uh, we were based right there in the city, essentially. So we were on the target within 10 minutes, probably. There was more resistance on this one right away. This one was as hazardous as any we had flown. The dust conditions were as bad as they had been anywhere else. In fact, we had one of the aircraft do a go around because it couldn't find the landing site on the first attempt. And uh, that's just a standard contingency that we practice and we brief. If you can't get into where you're trying to go, it's just like in a commercial plane, they're gonna go around and give it another try. The, the direction that you turn, what you do, if you have to make a go around is all pre-briefed and pre-planned so everybody knows what's happening. There's no confusion on anyone's part. Uh, but it was, it was a riskier venture, I think, than any one we had gone on before because of all those factors. Uh, I was flying again in this particular case. Uh, Ray and I had been alternating who was on the controls from mission to mission. This happened to be my day to fly. Uh, and I was flying and he was, he was doing all the, uh, the co-pilot duties. And uh, I remember going in there, having a very hard time finding the target again because it was so dusty. Uh, but getting to the right intersection and being essentially blind except for being able to see the top of a telephone pole right down by my right foot. If I hadn't had that telephone pole reference, I probably would have had a difficult time maintaining my position over the, the, the fast rope insertion point. But I had it, and again, with the help of the, of the guys in the back, uh, giving me last terminal guidance, as you, as you might describe it, to, to move directly over the intersection. We got everybody in where they needed to go. Uh, departed the area, went north of the city, and for all intents and purposes, we were done because we couldn't go back in to do an extraction. We knew we were just a contingency force at that point. When the worst of all contingencies happened, about 40 minutes into the mission, uh, Cliff Walcott and Donovan Briley's aircraft was shot down by what we think was a rocket propelled grenade and they crashed in the city. I'm an eternal optimist, and knowing uh, the, uh, the level of training those guys had and what kind of pilots they were, it never occurred to me that they would not do anything but successfully land that aircraft on the ground and we'd see them later on during the debrief. In fact, I didn't know that they had died in the crash until I was released. Uh, again, not a, not a good situation, but 
well within things that we had planned. We had a search and rescue aircraft on call to, to react to this. They did react. We extracted some of the people on the ground with another aircraft. Seemed like the situation was brought into control when our aircraft got called in to take their place. We were called into the target area to provide fire support, aerial fire, basically, for the troops on the ground while they conducted their mission. Well, the firing, the shooting had gotten pretty intense at this point. And when we flew in there, the other challenge for us was we didn't know where any of the friendlies were. And, uh, you know, the cardinal rule is if you don't know where your friendly forces are, you don't shoot. And we armed the guns, but we had a discussion among the crew on the way in. is about a three-minute flight. And I remember telling Tommy and Bill, look, you know, things are chaos down there. We're not going to shoot around until we figure out where everybody is. And unfortunately, when you've got small elements moving doorway to doorway in locations that have not been planned, because now they're moving to the aircraft, uh, it's very difficult to sort all that out. So in fact, we never did fire around from our miniguns uh, before we were shot down. We only made it around the pattern probably four or five times, the pattern being an orbit around the, uh, the target area. And, uh, and we were hit by what we think was a rocket propelled grenade also, right in the tail. We're, we're going through, and this all happens in a matter yeah, of I, milliseconds. I, I, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a very compressed sequence. But the, when you play it back in your mind, it, it's drawn out to, a, to in what feels like minutes is really seconds or even uh, milliseconds. But uh, it felt like hitting a speed bump in a parking lot. If you're driving your car about 20 miles an hour through a parking lot and you hit a sizable speed bump, that's exactly what that RPG felt like when it hit the aircraft. And I, I rolled it out, looked around in the cockpit, everything looked fine, and a radio call came over the radio from the, uh, what we call the air mission commander who's in charge of the whole air operation, saying, you've been hit, you better put it on the ground. Well, as you know, as a pilot in command of the aircraft, the control of that aircraft is your discretion. And I, I thought in my head that this is a flyable machine. Everything looks okay inside. It's made to take this kind of punishment. If I land here, I'll have to crash it intentionally because there are no landing zones. So I'm going to have to just crash it in an alleyway just to, for the sake of getting it on the ground. And to compound that, there's a firefight going on down here. So I was faced with a decision to try to fly an aircraft that I thought was flyable a relatively short distance, less than two miles to get to the airfield, or crash in the middle of this firefight intentionally, and it was pretty clear what the de right decision was. The piece of information that I did not have was the fact that that RPG had hit the tail gearbox and blown the actual gearbox housing apart, and uh, we had no fluid left in that tail gearbox, and we had bent the drive shaft. That tail drive shaft is turning at a pretty high rate of speed, and any kind, anytime you got a, a drive shaft that's delicately balanced that now is bent or damaged, it's only a matter of time before it, it totally disintegrates, and that's what happened. We, we were flying for about five seconds when uh, the tail completely disintegrated and uh, about three feet of the vertical fin went along with it. So in addition to now having a single rotor helicopter with no tail rotor, we have a center of gravity problem because that's a lot of weight way back in the back. Uh, far away from the center of gravity of the aircraft. If you've ever flown on a small airplane where the pilots ask you to move to the middle, that's the center of gravity. They, they, in order to maintain within the regions of control of the aircraft, you have to stay within a certain distance of, of what's called the center of gravity. But when you lose large components like the tail rotor that far from the center of gravity, it causes, the, in this case, the nose of the aircraft now to pitch down. The, the nose pitched down. Well, the automatic reaction to a nose pitching down is to pull back and bring the nose back up. Unfortunately, what that does in the helicopter and really in any aircraft is it reduces speed. Well, speed is the only thing that's going to help you when you have lost your tail rotor in a helicopter because that tail rotor is there to keep you from spinning. And with speed, there's enough wind coming across the fuselage to streamline you in the direction of flight if you're going fast enough. Well, as soon as you slow down below a certain threshold, it's completely out of control. You can't stop it. You're, you're spinning so rapidly that, the, in my particular case, the only thing I could see 
was brown earth and blue sky. Everything else was a complete blur. The only thing going through my mind at that point is stay upright. Get the aircraft on the wheels. It's, it's designed to absorb impact, but only on the wheels. If you land on its side or if you land upside down, all those safety features are totally worthless. So we are struggling as a crew to get that aircraft on its wheels. How did I do that? I have no idea. At that point, it's all automatic. If you talk to somebody that's been in a car accident, they'll tell you the same thing. They weren't thinking about brake, ease off the brake steer. It's all automatic. It's whatever you've learned to do through your experience as an as a operator of an automobile. It's the same thing in a crash. Uh, you're not thinking a lot. You're, you're responding automatically to the things you know will help you in this case. Ray and I did communicate during the crash sequence very briefly. As soon as the tail came off, I made a radio call stating that we had lost the tail rotor and we were going in hard. Then I remember looking over at Ray saying something about we better pull the engines off because that is the only way to stop the spin is to shut the torque off, which is being created by the engines. And he was already doing so. He was, a, as I said, a very experienced aviator. He had experienced something similar to this before in an accident at Fort Chaffee. He knew exactly what to do. He was already doing it. But the truth of the matter is the centrifugal force was so severe that he could not keep his arms up to shut those engines off. It actually drove his arms down. Uh, so we ended up with one engine at about half power and one at about idle power. We did. I never saw it coming. Uh, I, as I said, all I could see was brown and blue divided by the horizon line. I never saw the ground coming. So th whether or not I pulled what we call pulled pitch to absorb the impact or not, I, I can't tell you, to be honest. I don't remember actually hitting the ground. But uh, we hit very hard, hard enough that even with all the safety features on the Blackhawk and as rugged as it is, uh, the seat stroke, the landing gear, everything else, my femur or my thigh bone still snapped in two on the seat when we hit the ground. Well, the, first of all, when you're initially captured, you're, you're fearing for your life. I mean, that's that's... We deal with everything in life as whatever has the highest priority is what you happen to be processing at the time. And, and when you're captured, the highest priority is survival or are, are you going to make it through the next few minutes. Uh, over time, that, that gradually dissipates and, and things start to stabilize and you realize that death may not be imminent. And now it becomes a psychological battle in how long am I going to be here? Am I going to survive long term? What happened to everyone else? That's, that's the thing that's really difficult is that you have no information. If there's one thing you crave in isolation like that, and I wasn't in isol uh, solitary confinement or anything like that, but when you're by yourself, you might as well be because you have no one to communicate with, is you crave for communication. You crave for sending a message or you crave for um, information about what went on around you, where is everyone else, what's their status, did they survive? I didn't know that no one else at our crash site had survived until I was released. And uh, that's... So you didn't know that until you were, you were released? I suspected it. I mean, the Somalis had told me that no one else had survived, but you, you can't trust them. They're the enemy, so you have to listen to it, and, and there's always an element of doubt until you've got some kind of proof where uh, that really is what happened because you never know what their agenda might be and, and what they're telling you. I mean, I suspected so because of the chaos at the crash site. I, I figured that it, they probably had not survived. I knew Bill and Tommy were injured. Uh, I, I wasn't sure about Ray. If anybody had a good chance of surviving, it was Ray. He had injuries that were similar to mine. Um, but as it turned out, he didn't survive the firefight. Well, it is certainly a, a psychological battle. Even with the injuries I had, it's more a psychological battle than a physical battle. And what I tell people is, although I never thought I would be held for any extremely long period of time, day five is day five, whether you're going to be there for six months or five years. You don't know, and that's what makes it difficult. And I think the big thing is not to get focused on the situation in its entirety. You have to focus on small pieces. It's like any other major event in your life, you, it can easily overwhelm you. However, if you break it into its components, you can, you can bite these pieces off one at a time. So I think the main thing you got to realize is I just have to make it through today. I mean, that's, that's lesson number one. Don't think about, I can't survive six months here. I can't survive three months here. You have to think about, 
I can make it to tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, I'll figure that out when it gets here. I mean, that, that would be the number one thing I would have to say in an overall strategy to survive something like this. The other thing is you have to have faith in your comrades. You have to have faith that you know if there's anything that can be done to get you out, they're going to do it. And, and I knew that. There was absolutely no question in my mind. They, they could not have dragged those guys out of Somalia without getting all of us. Uh, you know, whether we survived or not, they were going to get us all out of there. And I knew that. And that, that provides you some sense of security. You, you feel like maybe you're almost not alone, knowing that, that everybody's out there and they'll do what they can.